Well, this is the wrap-up session uh, after a very interesting and exciting session on um, drug-looting stents, new stents, anticoagulation, and then new devices, BR BRS and DEB. I'm joined by my colleagues, Patrick Soroyes, uh, Yoshio Numa, Michael Howdy, and... Um, oh my God. Yeah. And, oh, thank you. Yes. No, no. I got oh, Yoshi. I forgot. Oh, oh, okay, Finn. My goodness. It's, it's tough to get old, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and maybe we should divide the this, this session into three, three mini-sessions. One is, are really all contemporary sense the same, or do we have some advantages? And we heard some uh, biology from Maloki in particular, uh, and then spend some time on anticoagulation, because there's a big thrust, of course, to decrease the duration of DAPT, but also consider getting rid of aspirin. And then we have the DEBs and the BRSs. So, um, Patrick, you've, you've seen this field evolve over time. What stents do you use for your patients? Does it really make any difference? Aloki seems to think that the fluoropolymers that uh, allow albumin in particular to be deposited on the stents are, are perhaps better. But we, then we have strut thickness and some other things. So what, what stents should we be using these days? No, I mean, if we look at the last uh, 10, 15 years, what happens is the cobalt chrome. Thanks to the cobalt chrome, we could reduce the thickness of the struts. That has undoubtedly a, a major impact in terms of uh, shear stress around the struts. Mm. That was the, the big benefit. Now, in terms of coating, we have been in three directions, eliminating the coating, making the coating biodegradable, and then the coating of uh, the science, which has uh, resisted uh, the test of the time, uh, it's still there, and I think uh, Aloki has convinced me that it's there for, to stay because there is major uh, capabilities. What is a little bit disappointing is that uh, when you talk about TLR, we are in the, uh, in the 5%, and it seems that uh, everybody, every trial is a me too. I have also 5% yes. of TLR. And I think that as a physician, we should go back to the uh, angina pectoris, which is at the, at the level of 20%. Yeah? And I think that uh, the solution is not necessarily in a better stand, but uh, in a better understanding of the physiology, what kind of lesion we should dilate, what kind of lesion we should not dilate, and where is the microvasculature. That's a little bit for me. Uh, uh, one of the uh, takeaway of uh, today uh, is uh, uh, maybe change the target. So again, it would get us into a discussion of FFR and physiology. It was covered in a different session, but I, I think it's a major unmet need. We have commentary from the others. Uh, Michael, in Europe, what, what stents are you using and why? I think in Europe we have a huge variety of stents available. Um, more than four handful different DS that we can use, which are approved. I think the tendency goes to go to the thin struts, at least, if not the ultra-thin struts. The data have been presented. There is this, this meta-analysis which shows some benefit for the ultra-thin struts. The major aspect is when you go to your daily life that you have the full range of sizes available. And nowadays, if we go especially to left main, etc., you need large stent sizes in diameter. You have to cover the range of five to six millimeter. So if you have that broad spectrum, then appreciating the thin strut thickness, then it comes down to the commercial market price of the different devices in order to choose this one or that one. This is always when you come to the practical aspect, the point that you then have to answer and you have to, to talk to your administration in the hospital. I guess I would uh, have a slightly different opinion because having studied all the stents in detail in different preclinical models, I would say that some are better for short-term DAP than others. Some have intrinsic thrombo, uh, anti-thrombogenicity, some don't. Uh, fluoropolymer coatings are very uh, anti-thrombogenic, as you know. The uh, BioLynx polymer has some anti-thrombogenic properties. Metal doesn't, as I showed. And the biabsorbable polymers, especially those with abluminal coating, don't really. So some stents will be better for short-term DAP than other stents. Now, the other issue is, uh, Patrick was saying, do the biabsorbable polymers, is there any difference? I think that in some of our data, we think the biabsorbable polymers end up having longer 
a better longer term results because the polymer absorbs, drug goes away, probably have better healing long term. So that, that's my way I think about it. And somebody who's high risk for bleeding, we're only interested in short term DAPT, I might choose something different than in somebody who has got a long term, uh, you know, can take a long term dilanopoda therapy. So that maybe that's a segue really into the short DAP discussion, which continues to evolve. Um, what stents do you think are have enough data to allow short DAP, meaning a month of DAP in, in uh, stable patients? Anybody want to take that? Are you comfortable with any stent short DAP one month, or are we really at, at the three month Time I mean, I, I don't think I'm comfortable right now. I would say that BioFreedom obviously was, tr was uh, shown in the trial to be, uh, have, have equivalent outcomes to a bare metal stent for one month of DAPT, but it itself is not coated with anything, as you know, and it doesn't have any specific antithrombogenic properties. So although it succeeded, there are probably other stents that are available that might be better suited to a short-term DAPT. When I say short-term, I mean one month. So it's ultra short, maybe. maybe ultra we should, short. We ultra have ultra short. thin, maybe I should have okay. ultra short. Yes, ultra short. I mean, this is a very sensitive topic. You see, when we look back in the history of uh, drug eluding stents, initially we were extremely harmed by the thrombotic events, and we were very cautiously now increased all our uh, concomitant drug therapy with the DAPT and a very long DAPT. And now we try to get it shorter again to the, at least to the level that we had before with the BMS, which was never an issue to have DAPT for four weeks. Now, honestly speaking, um, I would like to see the, the randomized trials that really show the safety in order to do that, rather than going to subgroup analyses or registries and extracting that information there. Yeah, recently we have also reviewed this, some of the OCT data on the coverage uh, early time point, like one month, two months, three months. All the stents shows the coverage of uh, approximately 80%, 85%, like uh, BioFreedom shows the 85% of the coverage at one year, well, one month. So uh, it, it doesn't correlate uh, too much with the uh, DAPT, and uh, it, it's very difficult to, to know that uh, what the OCT means. Yes. And, uh, so, so it's very difficult to, to uh, predict that which stent is, yeah. is better than the others. And uh, as uh, Michael uh, said, that we need uh, really the randomized data to, to have uh, confidence to, to use the short DAPT. So I know we don't have randomized data, but looking at you and having heard your discussion about imaging with BRS, if you, were, if you really wanted to have a patient with stable angina take DAPT only for a month, would you argue for intravascular imaging? to support the technique, or do you think it doesn't matter? I, you mean the, to stop the DAPT? The and would you feel, I guess, would you, another way of saying this, would you be more comfortable stopping DAPT at a month if you had done, let's make it more, more specific, if you'd done OCT imaging to confirm the fact the stent was properly implanted? Yes, I, I think, uh, yeah, uh, definitely I think the OCT, uh, using the OCT as a guidance of the implantation will improve the uh, uh, outcome, the position, and probably I believe that it will influence the uh, uh, speed of the healing so that uh, I would be a little bit more comfortable to, to stop the DAPT if we are doing the uh, procedure uh, under the guidance of the OCT or the IVAS. Anybody want to be somewhat more driven, data-driven? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, as a matter of fact, with uh, Yoshio Numa, we have done that kind of studies. Yeah. We took the stent of Le Pou, which is nanopore, uh, without coating, and then we did the uh, OCT at three months yes, and at yeah. six months. What I learned from, and we did OCT 3D of all these patients, you must imagine the amount of work it was. What I have learned is the extraordinary diversity of the, of the patient. Mm -hmm. You have individual who is completely covered in one month and other individual completely uncovered. Mm -hmm. You remember that lady, yes. yeah. three months, not a single sign of coverage, whatever the coverage is. And then you give another six, six uh, three months and you get perfectly uh, covered. I think it's the moment to say that we are almost at the end of a trial called ASSET which is acetyl salicylate elimination trial. So we have done now one trial in stable patient where we don't give at all aspirin. And I think that you have to really 
discuss the value of aspirin, which is very historic. I mean, uh, uh, the, you know the story of the, the young Andreas Grunzik asking the young Valentin Förster, what should I give? Anticoagulation of antiplatelet. And at that time, as antiplatelet, you have only aspirin and persantin. And he went for aspirin. When the stand came, aspirin was not enough. We had to have diclopidine, and we get in the DAPT forever. But uh, I'm not so sure when I look at the pharmacodynamic of six agonists, uh, Prazugrel, Ticagelo versus aspirin, I really don't see the true value of aspirin. I know that it let bleed the people, uh, but uh, basically all the tests, at least in, in lab, uh, does not give any element of synergy of aspirin right. versus it's, the powerful Ticagelo and Prasugelo. It, it seems to bring with it GI side effects, GI bleeding, that are not quite so prominent with the other antiplatelet agents, with maybe not so much benefit above and beyond what, what they could have. So, yes. Patrick, for the audience, could you just summarize global leaders and, and the, the set, what are the lessons from global leaders and where is that whole process going? I think that uh, we'll, with global leaders, uh, the 4PI makes somewhat the wrong uh, design. I think we were too ambitious. I mean, the first year, uh, we want to eliminate the aspirin to eliminate the bleeding, and then we want to do a second year, which was a kind of attempt or foundation for uh, secondary prevention with only one antiplatelet drug and a dip, that would be the, the Ticagrelo. And I think that it works quite well the first year. Basically, if we had stopped the trial at one year, we had the p-value, we had the significant uh, reduction of risk. But then the second year, the adherence to the Ticagrelo start to plummet. Uh, and, and that's because Aspirin is so much ingrained in our brain that we give aspirin to everybody. But every time that there was an event or intervention, some bleeding, the ticagrelor was dropping. So we end up with uh, an adherence below uh, 80%. Why? For the aspirin, it was above 90%. That might be an element. Uh, Stefan Windeker is still working on the adherence and per treatment. But the first year was okay. Was there a crossover from Ticagolo to aspirin in the second year? No, the second year there was only Ticagolo no, and mean, only uh, un, aspirin. I'm sorry, unintentional crossover. Now, crossover was not so much uh, the issue. What was more the issue is that uh, after one year, the people have a tendency to stop the drug. Yeah, While the physician has a great tendency to say you have to take your aspirin. I mean, aspirin is for us uh, 30 years of uh, brainwash. So we're trying to get rid of the aspirin. Now maybe we should talk about getting rid of the stent. So if we could have a few words, a few, few minutes on, on DEBs. Um, you know, in the United States, there's been some concern raised about paclitaxel and its relationship to mortality or possible relationship. The FDA has weighed in. Um, can we get comments? Is, is the FDA sort of overstepped their bounds in requiring a discussion with a patient about mortality risk? Where, where are we going with that? I mean, I, I, having dealt a lot with this recently, overstep their bounds is hard to say when the, uh, some of the data from individual companies does show differences in mortality favoring the uncoated device. So I don't think they've overstepped their bounds. The question is, is what is the mechanism for the increased mortality observed with paclitaxel living <coughs> stents and paclitaxel living balloons? As far as we can tell from the histopathology, knowing the drug doses, having studied this in, in detail, there is no clear cause or understanding for how such an event could occur, especially when we use paclitaxel in chemotherapy and we use doses in the balloons, which are tiny compared to what's used in chemotherapy, where it saves lives. So I think there's a big, uh, there's a lot of unraveling that has to occur, and you must know that in paclitaxel eluding stents, the data has been shown. There were no, from what I understand, there were no uh, increases in mortality seen with taxes stent versus serolimus living stents. What's, I mean, the pers what's the perspective from Europe? Yeah, in, 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 in Europe we, we, we were still discussing it, so we were not uppertaking it and making it so negative as it is. For me the major question is, and that goes back to 
the American colleagues. This was all generated for the peripheral use of yeah. the device, so the, the, the load of the Paclitz axilla is somewhat higher than we use for the, for the coronary treatment. So is it now extended also for the use in the coronary field in the US, this uh, reluctance to stay away from it, or is it just for the periphery? Because, um, I mean, we have a guideline 1A recommendation to use a drug-coated balloon for instant restenosis yeah. treatment. I think if we would take that away because of these data that were generated for the peripheral usage, it would at least take a significant uh, chance to treat patients with instant restenosis for me. I mean, I think uh, my belief is that the scrutiny around approval for drug-coated balloons uh, is going to increase. So the amount of data needed is probably going to increase. There is, a, there is an FDA panel that's going to be held that's in right. June to adjudicate this issue. But even if they uh, look favorably upon Paclitaxel, it'll be hard to escape the taint that's now been put over those devices. So for that's a U.S. perspective. In, in Europe, are you using it for ISR, for small vessels? When are you using it? And, and no, give, give us a sense of the magnitude of, of use relative to other options. 80%, 80% is used for the classic indication of instant restenosis. Yeah. And 20% is used for outside scenarios which are not so much um, well documented in clinical science, yeah. small vessels, bifurcation scenarios, etc., etc. So on a more individual operator decided um, But level. The, there are new generation coming. I mean, yeah. uh, your lab has, uh, yeah. together with Pedro Lemos, we yeah. have looked at these sirolimus encapsulate in, uh, in lipid to stay yeah. much longer in the, uh, in the vessel wall, even reach the adventitia. So I think there will be some, some revival in yes. that direction. Yeah. I, I suspect in the future it's yeah. going to be very important. It could be in the coronary space as well. Yeah. I mean, and it's maybe lower hanging fruit, Steve, than making BRS because, you know, you leave nothing behind. They love it in the periphery. Same thing in the coronary. Well, maybe we should transition in the time remaining to, to BRS. We, we heard about how many of the, uh, the implantation technique in general could have been improved upon with the use of intravascular imaging and perhaps more consistent approach. I think that's somewhat of an old story now. But um, now that we're going to have information about the, you know, beyond three years for absorb, for instance, we'll hear five-year results at TCT. Uh, we're, we've had some inkling of where that may be going, or at least some thoughts. Uh, those working in that field. What are the five to six year results going to be, look like and, and is this still a, a, a technology to pay attention to long term or not? For, for me, it's, uh, first uh, we have to find a way to make this uh, uh, strut thin. We have to be in the range of uh, 80, that's mm -hmm. point number one. Point number two, we have to be sure that these struts, when they dismantle, because they dismantle, are some way encapsulated. That's a little bit the dilemma. I don't know how we are going to do that by a, a fast bioresorption, like uh, for, for extent uh, the magnesium. That's uh, some of the question. And then there is some totally out of the box technology which are going to appear in the upcoming years. Yeah. I think Patrick nicely summarizes what is the demand. Um, usually, what we have used as a, a, a quality. Um, parameter the late lumen loss in this particular scenario is not reflecting mm -hmm. what we really would like to see. I think we can accept somewhat more late lumen loss but then have the device being completely encapsulated and, and the dismantling is happening at that time rather than you have the struts adjacent to the vessel wall or only partially embedded and then the, the, the dismantling is happening and then fractures are hanging right. in the loop. So does, that seems to be a, at least my way of thinking that's a common problem, and it, and it may not occur, it, and even if the bioabsorption is shortened, you still have that, that problem. So or, do you think we're going to have to marry some form of advanced imaging like OCT to implantation for all BRS? If you, if you just allow me to say, is when you look at the data for the magnesium scaffold, it was always mentioned, sometimes accused, that the late lumen loss of that device That's is right. significantly yeah. higher. It has a significantly shorter absorption time, one year right now, but the late lumen loss is about 1.5 times higher than that we, what we have seen, for example, for the BVS. But from the aspect that we are discussing right now, it could be beneficial. 
I mean, we are not talking about yeah. late lumen losses which are going to create or translate into significant right. clinical endpoints. But it could mean that this is a safety margin that the device is going to be encapsulated, in particular if you have such a reduced time slot of resorption. Well, maybe we can summarize as we're about out of time that, you know, this is a field stents that have been around for a long time. People like to think it's mature, but I think that what I got from this today's session, is there's still a lot more data we need and we're still evolving. <laughs> you know, the other day I was um, uh, telling the audience that the first stand was Charlie Dotter in 1966, knitting all self-expanding. <laughs> that's, that's more than 50 years now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think... Uh, I believe that the imaging is somewhat uh, improving the outcome because uh, in Absorb Japan there is one cohort, one third of the population who had the OCT at the time of implantation and that cohort, there is no very late scaffold thrombosis. Yeah, the right. uh, very late scaffold thrombosis occurs in the other two cohorts where the, there is no OCT at the baseline. So there is an indirect, uh, it's very indirect evidence but I think there is a possibility that the uh, uh, using the imaging guidance could improve the uh, um, yeah, outcome of virus over scaffold. Right. Well, I'd like to thank the group. Uh, we're slightly over time. They may have already cut us off, for all I know. Um, but we still need more data, right? The field's Absolutely. evolving. So thank we'll you. come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Great. Good. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Thanks.